the faith of Abraham. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 9, this is just a preview of the scripture that we've already been talking about. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Be our preacher and our teacher tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You, let me take just this long to give you a little preview. Paul was writing to the church in Galatia because he believed that they were committing some serious errors in their perception of the law and grace. Paul had taught extremely strenuous that salvation was by the grace of God and that we are also not only saved by grace, that we are kept by the grace of God. But certain false teachers had infiltrated this new church and they were Jewish Judaizers. And they had confused grace and the law. They did not want to give up on their tradition. And so they insisted that while you were indeed saved by grace, that you had to be kept saved by your obedience to the law. That is by your own works. And as a result, these Galatians, these new believers, had become confused. And they had lost their assurance. And they had gone back in to the bondage of the law. And this was more than Paul could comprehend. How anybody could understand that they are saved by grace and understand some precept and concept of grace and then turn around and go back in to try to say, stay saved by being obedient to the law. For those of you that may or may not know, that is called legalism. And it is as prevalent today as it was in Paul's day. There are major, major denominations today that are based on legalism. So Paul said this in verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you. Barclay translates verse 1 of Galatians chapter 3 this way. You senseless Galatians. The New English Bible says this. You stupid Galatians. In any case, it seems hard for Paul to believe that anyone could be saved by grace and turn again to justification by works when Christ paid the price through grace and love. To prove that we are not saved or kept saved by the works of the law, Paul makes a reference to Abraham. Now, Everybody in that particular day and time, if you had any semblance of a Jewish background, you knew who Abraham was. Every Jew today knows who Abraham 
was. Okay? So Paul says, I want to give you a history lesson. And this is the lesson. How was Abraham saved? And how was Abraham kept saved? Was it by the law? Was he saved by the law? And if he was, was he kept saved by the law? Or if he was saved by grace, was he kept saved by keeping the law? Now, Paul knew the answer. That is an impossible possibility. You say, why is it an impossible possibility? Because Abraham knew nothing of the law. There was no law when Abraham was saved. The law did not come until Moses was on the mountain with God. Abraham lived 400 years before the law was ever given. So if there was no law, then how did Abraham get saved and how was he kept saved? Paul's answer in verse 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Romans chapter 4 verse 3, Paul says this, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for for righteousness. Notice the wording in the word of God. The Bible says in Galatians and in Romans chapter 4 verse 3, Abraham believed God. The Bible didn't say he believed in God. It said he believed God. There is a vast difference in believing in God and believing God. In fact, the Bible tells us that demons believe in God. Lost people believe in God. One day, atheists will believe in God. But that doesn't mean that they're saved. You see, to believe God is to believe the Word of God. Psalms chapter 14, verse 1 said, A fool says there's no God. To believe God, now watch this, to believe God is to accept what the Scripture says about His Son and accept what the Scriptures say about His promises. Believing in the existence of God is not enough. We've got to believe what God says. The only book that contains the promises that God has made to us is the Word of God. To believe God is to believe His Word. You said, Prince, you jumped on that this morning. <laughs> you ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> Listen, I am adamant about the inerrancy of the Word of God. I am adamant about the Word of God. I believe it. I love it. I stand on it. I study it. And it's like walking through a minefield of gold nuggets every day of my life. Abraham believed God. What does that mean? He believed what God said. Therefore, the vital question is, what did Abraham believe? Well, we've given some answers in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 15, from which Paul quotes Galatians chapter 3, Genesis 15 is the great faith chapter of the Old Testament. Just as Hebrews chapter 11 is to the New Testament this great faith chapter. In the record of Abraham, we have the complete story of the gospel. Verse 8 says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. The gospel that God preached to Abraham centers around a promised son, a birth, a death, a resurrection. 
what was the lesson? His name was Isaac. Guys, listen, this is not hard. This is not hard. The, the problem is we made, we've let preachers make this stuff hard for us. Here is a picture of his virgin birth, a picture of his death when Abraham took him to Mount Moriah, and a picture of Christ in his resurrection when God called to Abraham to spare his son. Yes, I don't see that. Well, let me just help you. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have children. They had a child because of the miracle of God. Is that right? God told Abraham that he wanted to take his son, his only son, Isaac, whom God had promised to bless all nations through. At that time, he only had one son. Are y'all still with me? And so God said, Abraham, I want you to take your son and I want you to take him up on this mountain to the place that I tell you and I want you to offer him a living sacrifice. I want you to take his life. And off they went. Abraham loaded all the, all the sticks and, all the, and, the, and, the, and the torch and all the, all the splinters and all the other stuff, the wood on, on Isaac's back and off he went. You say, why would he load it on Isaac's back? Who carried the cross? You see the picture? And they got to the place. And Isaac said, Father, I see the wood. And I see the torch. I don't see the sacrifice. You know how difficult that must have been for Abraham? You know what his answer was? My son, God will provide the sacrifice. And they put, the, they put all the wood on the altar. And God said to Abraham, I mean, Abraham said to Isaac, son, get on the altar. And that's all God wanted. No, 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 no. He wasn't finished there. He took his knife out. But God wasn't finished there either. When he drew the knife back and he made his downward swing, God knew that in his heart he was willing to sacrifice his only son for the sins of a nation. And God stopped him. There was a day in the garden where Jesus said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But that wasn't all he said. He said, but nevertheless, your will be done. And that day, that father allowed that son to take another woody cross on his back and give his life a ransom for many. All of that was in the gospel that God preached to Abraham. Genesis chapter 15 verse 1 said, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Just as sure as Abraham returned from his great victory over the four kings of the north and had delivered Lot and his family and the five other kings, now he becomes afraid and fears that the kings against whom he fought will come back and take revenge. God intervened again, and he said, Abraham, fear not, for I am your shield. That is, don't be afraid, because I'm here to protect you. 
And the Lord has an your exceeding great reward. God seems to say that you have refused the wealth and the spoils of the kings of Sodom. And now I'll be your reward. The promise of God. Abraham made a strange reply. He tells us that he is not sure that he can believe God. Since another promise God had made previously to him had not yet been fulfilled. See, all of this is what I'm doing is backing up and let you see what happened prior to what we already talked about. See, God promised Abraham a son and he didn't get it yet. Time passed and he still didn't get it. That my very first clue in the Bible that Abraham was a Baptist. <laughs> yes, well, I didn't know that was in there. Well, you can't read it in the King James Version. It's in Clifton chapter 6. You said, well, what makes you say that? Because when God didn't operate on his schedule, Abraham took it into his own hands. Hmm? With a little help from his bride. Huh? Genesis chapter 15, verse 2 and 3, it reminds God and says, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and, and the steward of my house in this Eliezer of Damascus and Abraham said, behold, to me you have given no seed and one born in my house is not my heir. Abraham complains bitterly. He got really kind of aggravated with God. The Lord immediately reassures Abraham said, this shall not be your heir. This is not your child. I have another child for you that's going to come out of your loins. He brought forth abroad and said, look now toward the heavens and the heavens and count the stars. If you're able to number them. And, and he said to him, so shall your seed be. And he believed in the Lord and it counted to him for righteousness. Now, what did God ask Abraham to believe? He asked him to believe what he said. He asked him to believe what he said. The Bible said Abraham believed God. Now, listen, guys. Listen to me. Every circumstance, every circumstance in Abraham's life seemingly contradicted every promise that God had made to him. Have you ever been there? Most of us have. I mean, God has made us promises and according to what we could see and smell and touch and feel, it's impossible. What's it called? F-A-I-T-H. Faith is simply believing God. And the Bible said in Romans chapter 4, verse 18 through 22, who against hope believed in hope, he talked about Abraham, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall your seed be and be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the divine record. Abraham's body was dead. Sarah's womb was dead. Unless God came through, there would be no child born to Abraham and Sarah. <clears throat> but God promised a son, and Abraham believed God's promise, even though it meant a miracle. And it was this faith that saved Abraham. He believed God. God preached him the gospel through a son by the name of Isaac because Isaac was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
What was true in Abraham's day is true today. Salvation and justification still come by believing God's word concerning his son. I talked to a young seminarian not too long ago. And he wanted to talk to me about if I really believed in the inerrancy of the scriptures and if I really believed in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And so I asked him this question. I said, do you believe Jesus Christ is the savior of the world? He said, sure, I believe that. I said, but you got doubts about the virgin birth? He said, well, I, I've just got some questions about it. I said, no, no that's not the, what I ask you. I said, if you believe Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, you cannot doubt the virgin birth. If he wasn't born of a virgin, he had to die for his own sin because he was born a sinner. And he looked at me kind of funny. He said, I don't think anybody ever told me that. I said, well, you need to find out something, what that book says. I said, what's going to happen to you, young man, is you're going to end up a poly parrot for some idiot professor. And that caused his eyes to get up a little bit bigger, <laughs> you know. And I said, if that book that you're planning on preaching from is nothing more than a bunch of stories, a bunch of myths that have to do with that with the Jews and nothing to do with us today. If all of that has, if all of the Jesus wasn't the son, if he wasn't virgin born, if he didn't atone for our sins on the cross, you have no gospel. I said, so this is what I suggest for you to do. I said, you need to start some kind of social ministry. Feed the poor, visit the sick, do whatever you need to do. I said, but don't get in a pulpit because you're going to screw up a bunch of people that trust you. Well, that conversation didn't last much longer. <laughs> but I promise you this, I planted a seed that day that he won't shortly forget. Salvation and justification still come in believing God's word concerning his son, that he was miraculously conceived, supernaturally born, and lived sinless. That's what John says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He that has, he that has believed on the Son of God has the witness in himself. And he that believes not God has made him a liar, because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. What is the record? that God gave of his son. There it is. The Bible said, holy men of old spoke as they were moved by God. The Bible said that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word translated inspiration in the King James is the word literally God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. Guys, men didn't write this. They just pinned it on a scroll. God spoke supernaturally to their mind in the person of the Holy Ghost. And they wrote as God 
told them to write on scroll. You said, preacher, you believe that? I believe that with all my heart. I believe that with all my heart. Listen, listen to the warning. Listen to the warning. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. You know what John is saying? No matter what men said, if it don't line up with God, it's wrong. Listen to what he said. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. He that believes on the son of God has the witness in himself. Who is that witness? God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Let me just tell you something. If that kid today had asked me to pray with her and she'd asked Jesus to come into her life, forgive her sins and make her a Christian, instantaneous, God the Holy Ghost would have taken up residence in her life and she would have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and predestined for heaven, the Word of God says. In Ephesians chapter 1, read Ephesians chapter 1 if you have any doubt about the doctrine of eternal security. But this is the warning. He that doesn't believe God has made him, God, a liar. Because he didn't believe the record that God gave of his son. You don't believe in the virgin birth, you don't call God a liar to his face. You don't believe in the blood atonement of Christ, you call God a liar to his face. If you don't believe in, in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, you call God a liar to his face. If you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and yours, you call God a liar to his face. If you don't believe in heaven, you call God a liar to his face. You listen. You can call me a liar and get away with it. But you better be really careful when you call God a liar to his face. The truth here is clear. It can't be stated any more clear. Salvation is believing what God says about his son, Jesus Christ. God knows of no other way of redemption for lost humanity. Guys, there's no plan B. There's no plan B. Ever so often you hear some spiritual idiot Say, well, you know, it's just kind of like a hub here. You know, here, here's, we're, here's this. this and I saw a guy do this one time. He said, here, here, here's, here's just the hub here. This is humanity. And, and we are all trying to get to the same place. We're just going in different Directions. That is a bald-faced lie. There is no plan B. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. There is no plan B. Now, this is pretty good stuff right here. I'm going to have to zip this up and put it out on Sunday morning. People today are trying to follow some vision or some emotion or some sensation. None of that has the answer. For it is written, for his, that is Abraham's sake alone. It was not written for Abraham's sake alone. Listen, Romans 4, 23 through 25. For it was not written for his, that is Abraham's sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and were raised again for our justification.
It's so simple. It is so absolutely simple that we stumble all over it. We stumble all over it. And I, I know I've probably shared this with you. I was preaching in a revival one time and I was talking about the simplicity of salvation. And there's a dear sweet lady that felt impressed of God to correct my preaching. Yeah, yeah. And she said, Dr. Black, I have an issue. I said, okay, put it on me. She said, you are making salvation too simple. I said, no, ma'am. I didn't make it simple. God made it simple. Now, let me ask you a question. I ask her the same question. If, if it is the will of God that all men everywhere be saved. Is that what your Bible says? It's what Paul said to write, when he was writing Timothy. It's the will of God that all men everywhere be saved. It's God's will for every person to be saved. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will what? Draw all men to myself. That's a promise. Why would he make that promise? Because it's the will of God that all men ever will be saved. Now, if it's God's will for me to be saved, why would he make it hard for me? Now, that's about dumb as dirt. Yeah, amen. He made it simple. He made it so simple that the Bible says this, whoever shall call on the name of of the Lord shall be saved. Not join the church, not be baptized, not stop smoking, drinking, cussing, chewing, hanging around with folk that do. All of those things are great. You just need to, you know, if you want to quit doing it, quit, but it's not going to make you any more saved. Hello? Amen. Amen. Listen, so we got some stuff. I, I'm just being honest with you guys. We got some stuff majorly screwed up in churches. Hello? Because we judge people by outward signs. Isn't that right? But, woo, but there's a scripture. Don't you like it when there's a scripture? But the scripture said, but men look on the outward appearances, but God looks on the heart. <laughs> Yeah. London and I were on a plane back from New Orleans yesterday. And uh, the plane had overbooked. And so Linda and I were able to get the last two seats on the plane. If I had been back one more seat, I would have been in the ladies' bathroom. The good news is I would have been the last one to hit the ground if the plane went down. <laughs> Sitting right across from us were two gay, two gay girls. You say, well, how do you know? Well, I judge from appearance, too. We all do sometimes. I know this. They were both female. And I know this. They did everything except undress while we were on the very two back seats. And I told Linda, I said, you know what I hope? She said, what? I said, I hope those girls are saved. She said, you think they might be? I said, they could be. Now, I'm going to tell you something, guys. That right there just went against mom and apple pie. Because I heard a preach, preacher preach one time that you couldn't be homosexual and be saved. I don't reckon I ever found that in my Bible. You said, well, the Bible said it was, it was wrong. Sure, the Bible said it was wrong. Yeah, the Bible said that swearing is wrong, that taking the name of God in vain is wrong. The Bible said gossiping is wrong. Glutton is wrong. <clears throat> Hatred is wrong. Bitterness is wrong. Unforgiveness is wrong. All of those things are wrong. 
Are you listening? There are no big sins and little sins, are there? The Word of God says in the book of James, if you're guilty of what? Of the least, you're guilty of it all. Is that right? Amen. Just well, You just can't live a gay lifestyle and be saved. Can you live a drug life and be saved? Can you puke in the ditch every night and leave people on the side of the road not sure whether they're dead or alive because you run a hawkbill knife up their belly? Can you still be saved and live that kind of life? Can you still be saved to be in a psycho ward for drugs? Can you still be saved and have a straight jacket wrapped around you and, and hope to God that you can live to the next day? The answer to that is yes. Because it's not based on my performance. It was based on simple childlike faith of a nine-year-old kid that said, Lord Jesus, I need you and I want you to come into my life and forgive me my sins and make me a Christian. He said, okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you tonight on the authority of the word of God. I said it this morning, you're here it again. God didn't call you to be the judge. He called you to be the lover of men. Amen. That, listen, I'd preach right there, son. I can guarantee you. <coughs> well, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, so none of us can boast. <laughs> well, what a great night. Lord, have mercy. If this stuff gets any better, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stand it or not.